Hi, this is a new episode of the Marketing Meeting, and today I'm joining, joined by Redim Madinic, founder of the branding and creative studio Brand New. Welcome, Redim. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you again after a short while, actually yeah. a long while. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so three, it's nice. three, four years is quite long in this times, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So I was, yeah, it was it was a pleasure to see you that you are still active and especially doing the podcast. So it's nice to be on your show and talk to you about all sorts of exciting things. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where to start because um, you know you have you are the author of six books. Seventh is coming mm-hmm. up. You have a very nice podcast that just launched like in uh, in January and you are already on episode 10, something like that? Eight. I think we got eight so far, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the number of episodes that I do in a year, probably. <laughs> and finally, I have a producer and then who's helping me out. But uh, also you are uh, into music. I, I, you are a musician, uh, which I'm quite interested in. It's a topic that I'm quite interested in and I don't know where to start, but... Uh, to, uh, in the matter of keeping it uh, not too no- long and uh, compact for the listeners, I'm going to start with the uh, post that you do you did today. It was about the do what you love myth. Mm-hmm. So um, you are doing your own business. You have you are running your own studio for the last 18 years. Um, do you love what you do? I'm obsessive about it. Yeah, I'm absolutely obsessive about what I do because I've no not only I've got branding studio, I also got a publishing imprint, and we're also starting some D two C companies. We're going to start, you know, specialty coffee, um, a brand, and we're starting a few different businesses and creating our sort of general online store. So creativity is amazing. You can do anything with it. So. I do love what I do, just like I lo- love being a parent, like I've been a, a sort of endurance athlete, like I've been a human being. And, you know, sometimes there's just headwind, you know, sometimes there's crosswinds, sometimes it's rain, sometimes it's sunshine, you know, and it's it's that balancing act of how we live and what we expect. Because as I said in my today's post, it's like creativity is a slight marketing problem, especially when you want to buy into it because it looks so tempting, it looks so amazing, you see the product of creativity and you're like, oh my words, you know, like I want to be doing this because I see people sat in studios, listening to music, working on computers, dressed nicely, you know, there's coffee, there's, you know, beautiful everything. And they're like, I'm sure that's really nice. Whereas it doesn't work that way. You know, like it's creativity needs to be a, a difficult topic. So we actually don't lose an interest because imagine climbing mountains, you know, climbing mountains, the stories about, you know, making it to the top of any any peak are not about like, oh, yeah, it was lovely. We had a couple of biscuits, you know, then we had a cup of tea, <laughs> then we got to the top and then we came back. You know, it doesn't work that way, you know. So it's all about that necessary friction. We need friction in our lives. We need survival instinct ignited that we problem solve things that we do. So sometimes you have an odd day. Sometimes you have a bad day. Sometimes, you know, it's... It's kind of getting ducks in a row. There's an expression in English, like in in in, in the UK, that you need to you get get your ducks in a row, and sometimes that doesn't happen. And that's when you realize through pattern recognition, and you can improve things. You can actually, you know, uh, analyze your process and think about what can I do here differently. What can I do in a way that doesn't upset me? Because I built up my brand branding agency only to scale it back down for a, for a mm-hmm. short while because. I realized that I was going after something for, you know, 18 years or if not, even maybe longer, only to find out that what I got isn't what I wanted. I, I had the clients, I had the work, we had the budget, we had everything, but I personally wasn't in the right mindset in the right time mm-hmm. to appreciate it. I had to remind myself that everything I've achieved is exactly what I wanted. I was going on that journey after that light and I got there but my life was in the right place. You know, I was young, probably we had a second child. Everything was a bit of a chaos. So there was mm-hmm. nothing wrong with what I wanted to achieve and what I've, what I've achieved and what I got to. Mm-hmm. But my life was a chaos. And I had to change the systems in getting to uh, appreciate creativity, how to do things that make me happy and how to create my own version of, actually, let's call it system again. Like how do I create a way of, 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 
managing the workload because you know we are parents in 21st century you know we're not parents in the 80s <laughs> yeah. you know we are in our we're in our kids lives and we do things more involved and you try to do it most you, you want to do this because you've seen firsthand how it wasn't exactly done well so it's about finding the right balance creating the right condition for everything because again there's headwind there's there's tantrums there's dramas there's all sorts of things you know poor kids like ill kids you know unpredictability of, of life so when you build on that on top of everything that we just create this crazy layer cake of responsibilities of busyness of everything but mm-hmm. i have purposely during the process of writing my t- two last books which are released in october 2023 i wanted to create the right conditions for my creativity Mm-hmm. and purposely scale back and and spend time on my creativity so I can enjoy it. Even though writing two books in within a year, it's obviously not exactly taking time off. <laughs> That's a whole another story. But it was all about making sure that I can do something at that time, which is going to be a milestone, you know, a mild pivot, you know, something that I can say, you know what, I could have carried on going the same way. Mm-hmm. And that would have got me nowhere because I already found that end point and I wanted to open a huge new chapter in finding um, new purpose, new explorations, yeah. you know, not using creativity for expression that can aid others in their pursuits of creativity. Mm-hmm. Um, in your new book, which is uh, in one of your new books, which is Creativity for Sale, uh, it's talking about how to start and grow a life changing creative career and business. So in the era of um, AI tools, creating better content every day, um, how do you think an artist or a creative can stay positive? Or is there a way to stay positive? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> That's a big question. But it's it's about mindset because it's about a relationship with the tools and creativity like how do you use it because it's easy to find yourself being a victim you know like the world is unfair you know i mean and there's all these new tools i'm going to be out of a job i'm going to be doing you know you know ai is going to replace me being a copywriter or designer or director or storyboard artist like you and i are old enough to know that when kindle came out was meant to be the end of books well it wasn't the internet came out it was meant to be the end of books there was always end of print end of books end of everything as we know it well that's never changed <laughs> that's never like the the books i mean in the uk we've had the biggest year of book sales on record like the books are selling more than ever <laughs> kindle's going down fractionally i mean i'm not saying like it's, it's, it's flopping but it's about kind of going back to roots because we just have these new sort of elements that show up and quite rightfully create new new opportunities and new possibilities of oh we can actually do this we can actually democratize the creativity bring things to the market in much much easier way where you know and, and this is a testament to it like this conversation doesn't have to be on the radio doesn't have to be you know slotted somewhere we don't have to record it in the studio like we can do this you know, from our homes, and we can have this conversation across the pond, you know, from London to New York, and it can be broadcast to anyone who wants to listen to it. That's the exciting part. No, Nobody said podcasts are going to be the end of radio. Well, no one said that, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, YouTube was never end of TV. In fact, you know, it just gives us more avenues and more tools because it's about finding what fits right for you, you know. So mm-hmm. I remember listening to a conversation with Malcolm Gladwell who said, when I was on the tube or well, on the subway in New York, let's call it right. <laughs> the subway is not the tube as we go here. But he said, I've noticed that people have gone from reading books to have had their phones and their headphones. So he's decided to start an audio company that produces content for audio because that's what we do. And I think audio books were a marvelous invention because you can consume so much more content Mm-hmm. as you go so you know you can be doing dishwasher you can be stuck in a dishwasher or going to the shops or going to school run or whatever and you can still carry on um reading and, and consuming content which is what we couldn't do before so you can turn someone who isn't exactly um, a book reader into a book reader which is mm-hmm. incredible take a break so i think being a positive in the world of ai is like accept what is it as a, as a tool here because 
I've had conversations with people talking about how artists who were painting pictures when photography arrived, they had mm-hmm. to change. We had cubism, we had new movements because you have to change how we see reality. So you always have to see like, you know, like almost like you start on the first day in a company, you get your welcome pack. This mm-hmm. is what you're working with. Enjoy what you can do because if it's, this is this exciting right now, it can be only more exciting because AI is still a calculator on steroids. It's an amazing thing that, you know, it can produce amazing things, but it's not here to replace you. It can aid your process and you can have a cra- crazy idea, especially talking about generative AI, how we can you now help you because you and I know there's thousands of different pieces of AI in our daily lives that we don't even take for, we take for granted. It doesn't even, re- we don't even register. It's in our lives. So, yeah, as an artist, I always say you can have a life-changing career because creativity changed my life because it provided everything in my life. Obviously, I can't measure creativity. I can't shape it. I can't, you know, I can't put it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pocket. But it's everything I've created for myself because I was going after my expression and creativity helped me to do it, to achieve it. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a branding studio and you're a creative director as well. Um, what are the um, AI tools or resources that you are adopting or using nowadays? We don't, we don't, we don't use much AI um, per se in a creative process. We use the enhancements that AI gives us. So, because we've always been working quite extensively in 3D. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like you, you, you create your own worlds, but tailor-made. So creativity is good for what if, you know, what if there was a, a, a deer with a queen's head, you know, doing something, you know, like you can sort of create these mashups, but we used to be able to do it manually before. So like to us, it's just enhancing the process, making it quicker. Mm-hmm. but it's not necessarily, you know, two way off the track because we still have to create custom made work for our clients that has to be translated into production. So when it comes to creative AI, we skirting on the outside of, of possibilities because our work requires less of it. But when it comes to, for example, my, my written work, I use very much ChatGPT as a, as a validator. I want to see how the world sees the thing. So you want to see the medium, the average, you know, because ChatGPT is kind of like a like a buddy. You know, like okay, what do you think of this? Because sometimes you look at it and you're like, okay, well, I've got my point of view, mm-hmm. but that's how I see the world. I don't know how the world sees me or how the world has seen other things. So it's almost like validating the ideas that you didn't think of. Mm-hmm. So I very much wanted to stay away from chat GPT as much as possible. But then I was writing two books and one of them, the creativity for sale is very much sans AI. Like we didn't touch AI in it, with it whatsoever. And it's very much my own sort of honest portrayal of how I see the world of creativity and how you can build a business and career. Whereas when it goes to broader topic, like how do you use mindfulness and creativity and how other people can be perceiving that topic of burnout and sort of conditions for creativity. I wanted to have a little bit of an idea of, of what else can be there because I just felt that I couldn't really just provide my own, like my first point, first view account, if that makes sense. So it was more broader. Like I was, I was working with two different editors, one on one, one on each book. Mm-hmm. And I wanted, I always write my books and then editors, kind of clean it up and sort of shape it in the right um right format uh purely for just having somebody else you know touching it because it goes out there it's not for me written for me so that's mm-hmm. what i wanted to do mm-hmm. So um, the, we've met because of the, um, with, with your book, with the help of your book, the book of branding. I, is it the third or fourth book that you've written? It was the third one, yeah. It was the third one. Okay. So uh, in between those times, you wrote that book back in 2018 uh, and till now. Um, what has changed in the branding world other than ChatGPT, of course? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I was looking forward to this question. Um, I think we have got collectively much, much better in branding. I think what used to be once a trailblazer is now one of many because the world has opened up bigger, bigger and wider. 
so we can see you know what once used to be a groundbreaking work by nike or you know i mean obviously you would know and you know every other sports brand or big brands and like benetton's and stuff like that is now normal you can create that work with five people you know we can create visual stunning stunning visuals our team was never bigger than five or six you know and we you know we can have a team of external freelancers helping you on a project and we now can see what first-hand result of good branding look like and it's not a problem to replicate it wherever you are in the world so when you see for example startups they used to be quite quite to the point really badly not branded like the, nobody cared about the name or messaging or positioning you know whatever like oh we've got this idea for software we are product heavy we'll focus on this and then one day we might fix it you know when you look at for example how Air, airbnb started when they rebranded i think it was in 2014 2015 they kind of changed the perception of what a startup could look like and, and other people followed and now you've not everyone's been properly given a nice lick of pain like dropbox and all the other tools you know like you see that obviously these companies have grown bigger and they need to look better but when you look overall there's very little surprise it's very little surprise i mean we now call it the brand deja vu because We've established you know, a number of routes that you can take with a, a rebrand and it's been followed. So you know, there's a trend in colors. Now there's a, a certain amount of rebrands that are trending colors. And you look at studios specializing, especially like startup and startup branding. And you're like, that just looks all the same. <laughs> you know, there's a little icon, there's a little type. And again, it fits in a way like, okay, you would expect that from a branding. So actually we kind of created a norm so like okay so for, for for running we've got a shoe okay okay for well, how do you produce a shoe well there's a certain specification of like it needs to be bouncy it needs to be this it needs to be durable it needs to be this and i kind of feel like with branding we just created almost this checklist okay have you got illustrated characters have you got animation you know have you got this it's i think it's given branding studios a bigger scope to be more impactful and create a bigger toolkit and actually have someone to launch a new startup on almost minimal budget with a maximum maximum return like you can actually do really amazing things on you know a few tens of thousands of dollars and we can have a really amazing toolkit that makes you look worldwide like no world class no worldwide world class so <coughs> excuse me what's changed is that because of all of this advancement in in, in understanding of what branding could be we don't have many surprises and i think it really now pays dividends to to realize how can you be different in in the world because i've been laboring this quote for a while recently that the market is only saturated if you look and sound like everybody else yeah. not my quote i stole it somewhere but it makes perfect sense you know yeah. if you look and sound like everybody else you feel you're in a saturated market like how do you stand out because what once used to be the standout is now the norm. So we bring in the breakthrough lower and lower. So but now what used to be, let's say in graphic design, like a, a laborious work is now a click of a button. Now what took mm -hmm. me, let's say five hours, some 20 years ago is now five seconds. In fact, even five hours be a generous, let's say what took two or three days, you can do it in a click of a button. So I find it sort of parallel, like in the hunter gatherer, um, um, evolution there we once upon a time we used to go and hunt for food you know we used to that's what we that what we used to spend time on and then we invented no sorry that was the, the progression of human kind of society was that okay we no longer have to hunt for food you know we've got the food so what do we do next and what do we do next so basically the baseline of everything has been lowered the foundation level has been lowered so we can see okay so what do we do what do we do next because when you think about the generative ai yeah that gets better weekly you know like that's just you know oh there's mid journey seven or whatever like it's just and it just gets better and better and better it's got still flaws but in terms of the progress it reminds you of how computer chips went from you know massive chips to microchips with many times more capacity because we improve and we evolve and we're making things better so the question in branding i think in my opinion is going to be what do we do next because everyone's caught up you know you, you the studios that used to have a particular style or be known for anything they all look the same now 
Like everyone yeah. produces the same, everyone goes after the same clients. And it's just like the, the branding studios usually come with a project and they go like, well, you know, we this this company is here to you know change the world and change this and change that. I'm like, but that looks like a company you launched two weeks ago. Like, I mean, it just you know that what what what's what's going on? So I'm I maybe sort of unduly cynical about this, but it there is a brand deja vu, and it's a huge one because you know we we we've, we've got a standard, which is great because look at back at our childhood, there was lack of standard. It was like anything goes, you know, whatever, just write it. Put it on, put it on the wall, whatever. <laughs> there was no branding per se. There was no, not, not people, not necessarily people, care, not sort of cared too much, or they didn't even have possibilities could be. Whereas now, with studio like ours, when we when we work on a new branding and we work on a new product, the product doesn't even exist. So we we create it in three D, where we do all the visualization, all the all the things, and we've been doing it for the last nearly ten years, like in that style. And now, obviously, we got more and more tools to say, you know, you can visualize your product, you can do this. IKEA catalogs are all 3D, you know, like jewelry is all 3D. Like, it's the advancements, you know, like we've created the most amazing tools, but are we going to hit a plateau? Like, what, what's going to happen next? Because I just feel, I'm not, I'm not sure if you agree, but like as humans, we need to catch up with what we've created because mm-hmm. in terms of just even content consumption, like I think it was for, for many years that, 70% of music on iTunes were never downloaded. You know, you've got 16,000 tracks on Spotify every day. And God knows how many humongous amount of hours on YouTube of, of the of the content's been uploaded that sometimes nobody watches. Yeah. So, like, we've got this more, 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 ever-expanding world with sometimes lacking meaning, if that makes sense. I Lately, I started adding um, to my briefs, uh, I started adding uh, also pages, saying that don't do this or don't use these colors or like a page where in that industry or in similar industries the colors that all the other brands are using and i put a note please don't go this path (laughs) try another path find another path because as you said i mean like one day i'm seeing um, a food brand looking exactly the same with a razor brand (laughs) Nowadays, when I go to a store, especially like the new organic type of stores where you have like thousands of startups, it feels like sometimes everything is looking the same and also the messaging looking the same. So um, nowadays, I mean, like what I try to do is that, okay, what are we doing different here? Uh, are, are we, we are looking exactly the same if we are looking exactly the same with others. So why are we doing this then? Uh, or if, if, if it's not for branding, then what are we doing? separately than others on the other parts of the business. Uh, that should be like kind of a differentiator, I, I guess. Um, in your, you know, the cre- creative process, before we started the podcast, uh, we were talking about like systems and how you manage your company, as well as all the books, podcasts, and so on. Uh, being in the creative world and managing your own business requires a big systems thinking and planning. And you have a book, very nice book. That you're, the other book that you have launched is Mindful Creative. Uh, and there, I think you are also sharing techniques and habits to transform, transform one's creative process in this book. Um, could you share like some tips and methods from there? Uh, I know that well, reading a book, I mean, first of all, I would suggest every listener to read your books because it's such a pleasure, not in terms of content only also, but the thing that you touch is something else and it's like colorful and very nice. Yeah. That's a very nice compliment. And I'll uh, try to condense 40,000 words in about two minutes of an answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, just a it's few the, up it's tips, book, maybe. Absolutely. <laughs> so in a creative world, and I can speak from experience, uh, we are very much catching up with what's, what's possible, you know, what's, what's, what's available to us. Because in my world right now, I've never been busier. My calendar never looked busier ever, in, no, ever before. But I am my own time management app. It's the discipline. You know, everything starts with me and when it starts how I want to run my day and how I run, run the workload, how I want to run my family. Because when we have, when we have too many possibilities, life is chaos. You know, and we, we don't want to say, oh, you know what, well, my life is predictable. You know, my life is this. You know, I, I have settled on this. I, I, this is this is my choice. Whereas 
uncertainty kind of throws the system in the air. And I've, I've, I, I used to work with this very inspiring guy called Pete Gosling, who's got his agency in Westchester and up sort of upstate from where you are in, in New York. And I saw his process probably 10 years ago and everything was automated. And I was just looking at him like, what do you mean? Like his Zapier just looked like, you know, Narnia. And I'm like, how? And it's like, look, I'm not that creative. You know, we do this and that. I'm like, you've got everything sorted. Like, this is incredible. Like your inquiry comes in and like, and his system were like, just incredible. And you're like, what do you do? Well, I'm still typing up, you know, the email. So that I've started typing up my invoices in InDesign or whatever, like creative people. Oh Tell me about it. <laughs> are sometimes, sometimes astoundingly non-creative in their, in their ways, because you think, I'm you know, a professional in graphic design. I'm a professional illustrator. I'm professional, whatever. I'm a brand strategist. You know what? I don't need the fancy stuff. It's all about like, you know what? There's people going hundred miles an hour doing very nothing because everything's automated. Everything's there. And that curiosity takes you to the places that when you try to run your own day, when you try to run your own goals and your system, basically you put your systems into the place. So you want when your goals to be achieved, then the world becomes slow and simpler because you, you can you know what's happening and when because you've just you've defined the spaces and, and the time in your calendar and your day that it can only happen in a specific certain time and it's the magic that happens you know in that meeting that you have you no know, you have once once a day you've got slot for a meeting you know and people can make it you know you give people 17 different options they'll book one and they'll change it they do this and when you say you know what in my day, I record a podcast either at 10.30 in the morning or I don't. I've got a new client meeting at one o'clock because that's after lunch. So that kind of fits the different time zones. And I'll be doing potentially another podcast recording at nine o'clock in the evening, which is what we're doing today. And that's my times so I can guarantee I'll be available. So therefore, I don't have to get stressed about something's overlapping and something's doing not because I can catch up with my team before the recordings or after recordings or before the meeting and after the meeting. So I've got my sort of flexibility in a day, but the pillars of my day are set. I know when my kids will wake up. I know what time they go to school. I know when I can exercise. And that sort of regimented discipline actually really helps because before it'd be like, Oh, am I busy at two? Am I busy at three? Am I busy at that? You know, and then you just you find you find yourself like this is my schedule, and you know what mm -hmm. that works because it's predictable, and you can then find the ways how you can grow and enjoy those pockets. Because what I found throughout working on these two last two books that I had to change. You know, like I was writing in sporadic times. I, I never had a sort of ring fence time for creativity. It was like. Well, I might have 20 minutes after dinner. I might have this. And, and, and it just never felt that enjoyable because, of course, you're on a survival instinct. Like, I need to get books out. I've said my publishing day. We have to do it. But it was it was mess for a while. And I'm like, okay, no new client works. We're just going to focus on our existing clients. We can get the studio smaller so we don't have to pay extra overheads and extra costs and extra salaries. Therefore, we don't have to work for everyone just for the sake of working with everyone. And let's be honest, like this is our chance to actually refocus on what we want to achieve because I believe I can get away with you pretty quickly. And mm -hmm. you go, well, I wish I wrote some books. Oh, I wish I did this. I wish I went there. I wish I did X, Y, Z. And it does come with the portion of like when you actually do these things, it's the uncertainty. Running your own creative career, it's lots of uncertainty. Nothing's given. You know, starting your own business, your startup, anything, uncertainty. But you're doing this, what if? You know, like, I mean, this is my chance to actually explore it, actually to do this. Because if you don't do it, you might end up with regret. So what's yeah. better, regrets or uncertainty? Because if it doesn't if it doesn't work out, you go back. And I always tell people, like, when you're employed, you're not in charge. Like, your security, you know, is not security. You, company can go bust. You can be let off. You can be made redundant. Markets change. Everything changes. So isn't it easier just to hold you hold on to your wheel and drive your own destiny and start your own thing? Because then in that in that space that you create for yourself, you can find so much magic in a way of, you know, I can create things that no one says I couldn't do. You know, like you can just explore the world for what it is. Because as I was saying just in the previous answer, like we've got the world of possibilities we created. 
that you can you can go to market with anything you want. You know, you can publish any type of work you want. You know, you can bring anything to the world that, you know, you'll find your little group of people that will say, we like this, we need more of this. So, you know, you just explore and experiment. And it's it's all about making the right conditions for creativity. And the whole thing was inspired by Ken Robinson, a mm -hmm. fantastic Ken Robinson, who was the pioneer of education and, 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 and sorry, of creativity in education, who said that the role of a gardener isn't to make the plant grow, it's to create optimal condition for growth. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what we need to do. Like creativity isn't to be found in around a corner or in our pockets. It's like to have the optimal conditions for creativity, which ultimately takes us to the state of flow. You know, obviously you need mm -hmm. to create the conditions for that. So... So, I mean, like, um, I'll go through the, um, you know, systems in book writing because, because you know, you you have you own your own business, uh, you have your own studio, you have clients, uh, you have your podcast now, but book writing especially, out of all of these, requires a very disciplined way of approaching things, approaching life. So you mentioned that how the time blocks that you put to yourself to write a book and so on. Other than that, like, what are the things that you have done when writing your book? Like, or, or, or some of the tips that you can share with us uh, Absolutely. while, you know, managing your own company and writing your book? What was the process? I can see how much you want to write your book. <laughs> I can see that. I can <laughs> see that. For two years, um, this in the plan, but <laughs> let's see. Yeah. So it, it, I think for about seven or eight years, I hope that there'll be some magical space and time for me to do it because it was always done amidst chaos. I mean, I did a book of branding, for example, in three months. I wrote it in a month. We designed it in a month. We edited it and we published it. I mean, the the, the, the secret is that that book is a first draft. Mm -hmm. Literally, I just wrote it almost like upside, like literally falling backwards on, on, on the sofa because I was falling asleep as I was writing because my son was going to be born. So I had a mm -hmm. deadline. And... Of course, I didn't invent the process of branding in three months. Obviously, I was writing about experiences running my studio for more than a decade. So it was more like, this is what we got in our head. We smash it together, let's see what happens. And of course, sometimes haste makes waste. You know, some like there's things in the book that if we had an extra year, obviously that book, that book would be different. But there's something quite happy and scrappy in the book that we made it happen in the record time. And people like yourself, I mean, that we are no? in, in this conversation just because of that book, like that the book actually found a new connection. So the process of writing is that if you're hoping for the golden time, because, you know, we like to believe that art, no? the writers are kind of sometimes they wake up, they live, they live in their cabin. And, and I think they're usually portray like a sort of the serial killer murderers, you know, in somewhere in a cabin, somewhere in sort of in a lake. And they, you know, they live their sort of happy life and then there's a twist. But to make things happen, it's very unpretty at first because you are driven by obsession. So the mm -hmm. first word in this conversation was like, how do you find the love? And I'm like, I am obsessed about the process. You know, I get up every morning and I want to find a new way how I can do this in a more, enjoy like find even more enjoyment and how I can do it maybe in shorter space of time so I can have time for other things, you know, like bringing that baseline lower and lower. And with the writing, it, if you're hoping to sit down and, and start having an idea for a book that will some, sort of start unravel, it will never happen. So my first tip, number one, is the, the, the tool to do this, and I picked up my iPhone, I write notes in my notes. Uh, in my notes app, I just write things I can think of. So, for example, today I listen to, I'm listening to Julia Cameron's, I need to get it right, Julia Cameron's The Artist Way, the book. Mm -hmm. And what I wrote was the or, the audacity, it's, it's the audacity and not the talent that moves the artist to the center stage. So that's just my one thing from today. Like I just write daily, daily, daily notes. I'm like, what I hear, what I think, you know, I cycle quite a lot. So I just kind of process things and I'm like, okay, I'm going to stop, write this down. I'm going to stop, write this down because one of, one of my therapists once said like, you don't have to write anything because the thought that you like will come back to you time and time again. It's not a problem. At least you're thinking about something intensely, it will come back to you. But when you go to studio, employees, you go, you know, business, another business, you know, 
podcasting everything like sometimes that there, there's very little space in the airwaves in our brain to actually say you know what i'm holding on to on this onto you so the advice is that you start writing your book today obviously you start thinking of what's your chapters like what's your title what is your second book you know what is your what is your series like what can you do because i think it was seth godin who said that you should go on a walk with your friend and tell them everything that you want them to know record it and have it transcribed and that's your first book you know that's literally like this is how you give advice because my books are not written as you know some sort of fiction they're like okay this is all i know this is all i know and it changed my life so mm -hmm. i can share that with you and you can take it leave it you know pick pick the bits that you like because that's what we do from other books you know i listened to julia's cameron julia cameron's book for about an hour and I wrote one sentence, you know, like it's just like picking out the things that, that resonate with you. And once you got more of an outline of the book that you want to write, like what's the topic, um, you start looking at research, who's written something similar, like how well has it, how well has it rated? And like, what else can we, you know, add to, to that, to that category, because there's zillions of books on, you know, MBAs and, smart thinking all sorts of stuff and only some of them are you know the ones they shoot up higher and of course in our lifetimes i don't think neither of us will achieve something sort of astronomical like you know being the next um <laughs> i just mentioned him earlier outlier was in malcolm gladwell you know so like you got the star wars and then we got all of us mortals but the thing is it's about trying to push the boundaries like what can i do especially on an independent basis that you don't need an approval of 14 different editors or, you know, marketing people and having sort of narrative of a big publisher. Because again, we've got these tools that can easily enable us to actually have that self-expression. So you don't necessarily want to write a book with AI, which takes about 15 minutes because that's just absolute nonsense of people's lives. But it's, it's, you start little just like with everything else, because you can liken it to running, you know, marathon running, you know, you're going to walk a mile, then you run a mile, then, you know, then you run two miles and you start building, building, building. So never wait for the moment that things might sort of start coming together because it's the gradual process of adding a little bit every day to, um, to get you to the point that, you know, will will give you something that start sort of shaping as, as a book content. Do you use a publisher uh, or like on your first book? Probably now, yes. Uh, but did, did you publish them yourself or how did that go? I'm fiercely independent. I'm fiercely independent. So I didn't wait for anyone to come my way to say, hey, do you think you've got a book in you? Because there will be about 77 million other people next to me going, I've got a book in me too, you know, like because if, if the book contracts were handed out that way, then the book libraries and the bookstores would be have to be in the size of a city center, you know, like everyone would have mm. their book in there, but no one would read it. So there's a reason why still the book of you know, the book publishing is very much kind of filtered. You know, there's gatekeepers in a way, because if you want to be part of a big publishing machine, would they take you on? You have to be really good. Just like a musician, you know, anyone can write music, anyone can put it on Spotify, anyone can make sketches on YouTube, you know, but how much people how many people would watch it? You know, you, you try to sort of take something good and build it bigger. Whereas in my case, I was like, you know what? My daughter was born, being born eight years ago. Actually, in fact, it's going to be an eighth anniversary of the first book tomorrow. Oh, okay. Eight years, eight years. And it was gung-ho effort. Again, I think I did it in about three or four months. And I was like a little sort of detective going around and looking at the back of the book, like where does the ISBN go? And I could bring it to the market, you know. I was thinking we'll do we'll keep it independent, sell it on our own website. And somebody said, Well, you need to put it on Amazon. So I just looked up how to set up an Amazon account, like a like a supplier. We printed a thousand books and they sold out in like three weeks. So we printed number three or four and and, and that first book sold forty five thousand copies, like independently. I still haven't got American distribution. So altogether with the new books is about seventy seven thousand books wow. now which again is done in a very, thank you by the way, but it's done in a very sort of still scrappy way, you know, like we've got UK distributor, but it's the little things that you need to fine tune and it's an investment. I put mm -hmm. my time investment, I put my money investment because we print 5,000 copies, just like the 
publishers, like just like a, no regular publisher would do, but we print them in the UK. They are sustainable. They are all printed with um, green energy, mm-hmm. you know. So we do it a lot more costly than we would do it in China, but we've got, you know, um, we can keep an eye on the process so yeah. we can actually fine tune things and we know it's, it's local and it just, it just makes sometimes really nice sort of feeling just to make books with, 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 with your friends in a way, you know, we know, we know about printers for like 16 years, but for different, different projects, but keeping it simple gives you freedom to explore because after selling all of these books, we now being approached by, you know, big publishers about, you know, new books. So we've been approached now by big publishers because they've, they paid notice because it was our own narrative that has enabled us to create things that would not be not necessarily accepted. So mindful creative, I'm not sure how, how I would sell it to a big publisher at first or creativity for sale or other books, you know, like it's very much we've got the opportunity to reinvent the wheel, <laughs> literally. Like, we've got the basics and how do we dress it? What do we put on it? That's our own making. We can actually do these things fiercely independent and change people's lives because we don't get edited, you know? I know I know people who spent three years on a book with a minimal advance that the book ended up being something completely different, you know? Yeah. And it's just like, there's, there's, there's a beauty in collaboration, but in your personal expression, if you want to pursue something, there's always somebody who's going to read the book because, you know, that's how everything started. I really love the way that you take business independently. You know, you have your own company for so many years. And uh, then when you when, it's com- when it comes to book publishing, then you do it on your own. It's independent also. I think there's like a lot of things to learn from there. And uh, to wrap up, I have like two, three, you know, Quick questions. Um, since we have talked a lot about the books, uh, if you could recommend one business book, what would it be? I actually had it handy. <laughs> uh, what got you here won't get you there. Um, I'm trying to remember if I read it it's, before. It's been, it's, been a, it's been around for a while. It's like a, I think someone says like a book, co- coaching book for coaches. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of semi-old school, but there's a lot of gold in it. And... There's a section that sometimes, you know, when you hear or see things in life, you're like, oh, I wish I thought of that first. So in Mindful Creative, we have meditation. There are three different meditations. You know, there's there's, there's pretty much toolkit on for creating optimal creativity, like bringing your right self to, you know, your problem task um, solving. Because Mindful Creative could be happy businessman or sudden or calm illustrator. Like we can have interchangeable titles. And in what got you here won't get you there. There's this exercise when he when he says, when I go to people and when they are sort of distracted, I say, close your eyes and count to 50. And how quickly will your mind interrupt you? And you start counting to 50. You're like, oh yeah, on, on seven, you know, I'm start thinking about washing, you know, start thinking about my shoes, whatever. The mind will arrive because... You'll probably won't end up counting to... <laughs> 50. Yeah, no, like, I mean, I've, I've been doing it in my, I've, I've borrowed it into my, in my coaching sessions and I think I had someone come to 21 once, but everyone like was struggling after three or four. And it's one of those things like, oh, I wish I had that. But the whole moral of the story is like, you can't hear the world if you can't hear yourself, you know, like you need mm-hmm. to find a clarity, like, because our worlds are so busy. So we, we've been, we've been working for a particular client for the last 15 years. And I remember making their belief posters. And one of one of the belief posters was this, what got you here won't get you there. And I'm like, you know, sometimes we have to align the things. It takes us time. And I was looking at it like, it kind of makes sense, kind of doesn't, you know, kind of makes sense. And then 10 years later, I was like, oh, it makes sense now. <laughs> because that's pretty much everything of this conversation that we've been you know, in the last 45 minutes is that uh, you can't expect to have one thing and it work it in perpetuity mm-hmm. it never works you have to change you have to adapt you know selling books has changed every single year what worked one year didn't work a second year you know like everything changes every year so that's 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 why we need to um kind of yeah take that mantra and you know, you know what you build something and you start rebuilding it as soon as you launched it and that's the acceptance 
Perfect. Um, and then I would add to that uh, Judy Cameron's book, Artist's Way. Uh, it's, Definitely, it's a book yeah. that I, since we've talked about it, I will also edit here. Uh, it's one of the books that changed my life, actually, because I'm when I read books, you know, there's the exercises that are on the book. Most people just, mm. you know, postpone it. Okay, I'll do it when I have time. I'll do, and I'm just like, when, when I really, literally do them, hundred percent so Amazing. that book That's changed really my life i mean this is this is why i'm i'm sitting here doing my own business and so on uh one music track you love the most nowadays since you are a musician I mean, <laughs> it's I a mean, hard question I, I, I know I, I struggle i struggle 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 um i mean nowadays i mean there's there's so much music i mean i can share some playlists with you but I, you know i always go into spotify as the 30 tracks of the week Oh, okay. and you just mm -hmm. you just you just live with them for i mean i've I've trained my algorithm so much that you know i've got i've got the most and you, amazing you, you music. use spotify still i'm on spotify yeah i just for, for, for i'm just on spotify just for discover weekly literally just for that um i would just recommend maybe jordan rakai freedom like he's got mm -hmm. a new album coming out beautiful music you know just lots of layers and and honesty and i remember going to see jordan rakai when he launched the last album just sort of mid COVID, like we had this period in the UK where you can go out for a bit and he was doing a he was doing a gig in a church launching an album and I was there literally just crying, like he's just out, you know. I was there like nobody like I couldn't get my friends to come out, so I was just set up with strangers, like for you know, a few hundred strangers watching Jordan Rakai with like a little bit and I was just like tears down running down my face because of everything we've been going through. So yeah, Jordan's maybe we'll add, add like a little bit of that track. Uh, maybe Ray will yeah, add yeah. a little bit of that that track to the edit. That would be not. Or, or add a link I will in the show to it right yeah. after this. Yeah, I'll send it to you. And one final question is: What's your favorite coffee place in London? My favorite coffee place. So I became the fellow of the RSA, the Royal Society, the Royal Society of Arts. Uh, which is a building which is 260 years old. Well, I mean, the society is 260 years old. And they've got a beautiful building on the Strand, just, just near the river. And it's a beautiful space. It's a beautiful space, but full of little sort of, it's kind of like a hobbit space, you know, like the, mm -hmm. the, the ceilings are not too high. It's not like, it's not, it's not your loft. It's the opposite of the loft. And it's got the most impressive library. Coffee's good. And um, yeah, the RSA is a place to go at the moment. I hope like before my UK visa ends, I'll come there and then we, we grab a coffee and maybe work a bit at RSA. Thank Absolutely. you so much, Redim. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'll stop the recording.